Hi, my name is Edward Yen, and I'm a geomedical oncologist at Baylor College of Medicine. I want to say a quick thank you to the, uh, the meeting chairs and organizers for having me here again this year. Uh, we should have heard Dr. Taylor just finish up with uh, non-muscle invasive disease, so I'm going to move on with uh, muscle invasive disease and, and immunotherapy. We're going to first look at uh, new action chemotherapy, which is the standard of care, and then move on to immunotherapy and, and specifically look at uh, three clinical trials. Cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy is the current standard of care for muscle-based bladder cancer. Commonly used regimens include uh, cisplatin gemcitabine and also dose-dense MBAC. Cisplatin combinations are associated with an absolute survival benefit of about 5% and a 14% reduction uh, in the risk of death. We know that uh, the PCR rate correlates with overall survival. Uh, those patients who are able to retain a PCR or a, 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 a PT0 ranges in about the 30 to 40 percent range. And for this subgroup, the uh, five-year overall survival is about an impressive 80 percent. Uh, that being said, uh, we, uh, there's an estimated about 40 to 50 percent of patients who are deemed to be ineligible for cisplatin, and that can include having renal dysfunction or heart failure or poor performance status. And even in those who are deemed eligible for cisplatin, we know that only 20% of these patients actually ultimately get treated with these combination regimens based off of uh, large database studies. So by some benefit with neoadjuvant um, uh, cisplatin combination chemotherapy, overall recurrence, chemotherapy toxicity, and cisplatin eligibility remain um, significant problems. Immunotherapy first began to change the treatment landscape for urothelial carcinoma back in 2017 and 18 when it was first investigated in the metastatic setting. Currently in this setting, uh, there are about five IO agents that are approved for the patients who are cisplatin refractory in a second line setting. And those included the ones, uh, include the ones listed here. Uh, overall response rates in the second line setting uh, ranges about 15 to 20%. The complete response rate ranges about 3 to 10%. Notably, pembrolizumab was investigated versus the second line chemotherapy in a phase three randomized trial. And you can see that the uh, response rate and the survival, median overall survival favored pembrolizumab over uh, second line chemotherapy. In the first line setting for cisplatin ineligible patients, two IO agents, pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, are approved. The overall response rate is a little bit better. The first line setting, uh, about 25, 30%, and uh, there's about an 8% um, CR rate associated in the first line setting. So overall, the side effects uh, for single agent immunotherapy is very tolerable, especially compared to chemotherapy. So based off of this data, it does make sense to investigate these agents further in earlier disease states. I'm going to start by looking at uh, the PURE-01 trial. This was a single-arm agent, single arm phase 2 study of uh, new adjuvant pembrolizumab in patients with uh, muscle invasive disease. These patients were treated with uh, three cycles of pembrolizumab prior to radical cystectomy. Patients were scanned before and after pembrolizumab, and uh, if they were non-responding, they were given the option of being treated with uh, four cycles of dose dense MVAC. The primary uh, endpoint on this study was PCR and the intention to treat population. The investigators did also look at certain biomarkers, including uh, pd one expression, DDR and RB1 gene alterations, and also uh, tumor mutational burden. If you look at the baseline characteristics, you see that 54% of the patients were T3, most of the rest of it were 42%, and 92% of these patients uh, were cisplatin eligible. Looking at PCR, which was the um, primary endpoint, uh, the median follow-up for this report was 6.2 months. PCR rate was 42% in the intention to treat population. The downstaging rate was 54%. There were no rhesus progressions. That being said, five patients were treated with dosens in back, uh, 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 four of them because of a lack of uh, radiographic response and uh, one, due to uh, transaminitis from the pembrolizumab, uh, two of these patients were able to be downstaged. Looking at pdl one expression and also TMB in terms of uh, and biomarkers, and overall, the uh, intention to treat population, pdl one um, high patients comprised about 70% of the patients. Uh, when they looked at patients who had PCR and split them into uh, pdl one high and low, pdl one high patients were more likely to have a, um, a PCR, 54 versus uh, 13%. Uh, looking at the baseline PDL1 scores uh, in uh, patients who were PT0 versus not, more likely the patients with higher PDL1 scores uh, had uh, complete responses as well. So 
switching gears to the uh, to uh, tumor mutational burden, the median uh, TMB level was 11.4. The investigators did find a significant association between uh, uh, P PT0 and, and TMB. So both of these were associated with a response in this trial. Looking at um, DDR, RB1, and also PBRM1 alterations. Overall, 52% of the, the patients in this trial had uh, one of these alterations, as you can see here. Uh, and some of the uh, DDR genes that they looked at were, are listed below. Looking at uh, the significance of, uh, of these alterations in the uh, T0, PT0 arm versus, uh, or, or patients versus the non uh, PT0 patients, uh, there was a, a, a significant difference. However, when they adjusted for tumor mutational burden, uh, the significance uh, disappeared. And so they found that uh, these alterations were not associated with uh, response in this study. So in summary, uh, new adjuvant pembrolizumab was active and safe in uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer patients and high PDL1 expression and TMB may be predicted for response to pembrolizumab in the adjuvant setting. Abacus was also a single arm phase two study of uh, neoadjuvant atezolizumab in the muscle invasive bladder cancer group. In this study, uh, cisplatin eligible and ineligible patients were recruited and also uh, treated with uh, two cycles of atezolizumab prior to surgery. Endpoints on this study were uh, PCR and also the increase in CD8 count. They did also look at certain biomarkers, including CD8 uh, T cell immunity, TGF beta, and uh, TMB. The uh, co-primary endpoints on this study were PCR, as we discussed earlier. Okay, looking at the patient characteristics, 74% of the patients uh, were T2, so definitely a, a lesser risk population compared to Pure 1. 0% uh, were no positive, 41% had uh, a GFR of less, less than 60. Most of the patients were able to, to complete the two cycles of uh, atezolizumab and go on to have a radical cystectomy. This is the uh, pathologic complete response, which is a, uh, the primary endpoint. Uh, in red over here in the bar graph, uh, you can see uh, in red is the pretreatment T staging. And uh, again, most of the patients were, were a T2 um, prior to treatment. After treatment is, is shown in blue, and you can see that um, uh, we have more of a spreading out of the T staging as well as some patients with node positivity. The overall PCR rate was 31%, and we did see some response PCRs in, uh, in patients who were previously treated with BCG and also who had T3 and T4 disease. The investigators did also look at, in addition to PCR, something called uh, major pathologic response. Uh, this uh, is illustrated here by these stains, and across the top there is a patient with a PCR, and you can see that there's no residual cancer there. Uh, the, the stain is for uh, CD8 cells, and uh, in the bottom row is an example of NPR, where, uh, which is defined as greater than 90% necrosis and having a staining for CD8 positive T cells, macrophages, and uh, tertiary lymphoid follicles. They were interested in, in this uh, endpoint uh, because um, a certain uh, lung cancer trials uh, were also investigating this. So, uh, but atezolizumab in the, in the neoadjuvant setting was active, was active and uh, produced uh, complete responses in patients with uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer. Switching to PDL1 status and also uh, CD8 as biomarkers, we're going to look at first PDL1 expression. 40% of the patients in this study were PDL1 positive. Uh, when they looked at uh, PCR patients by, by PDL1 positive versus, neg uh, versus negative patients, I guess, there, there was uh, no significant difference, uh, although there was a slightly higher in, uh, percentage of being uh, PDL1 positive, 37 versus 24 percent. Looking at the CD8 positive immunity or density as a biomarker, looking at the, again, the patients with pathologic complete response. Looking at those with a um, higher CD8 positivity, certainly there were, there were more people who were likely to have a higher median CD8 immunity versus not. P-value here was 0.04%, and uh, looking at the one-year relapse-free survival rate was 85% in the high, high density population. So, but in short, uh, no significant correlation between pdl one expression and outcomes were seen. However, there was a correlation between the pre-existing CD8 positive T-cell immunity and response. The uh, investigators also looked at CD8 uh, further in terms of a, an 8-gene signature uh, called TGE8 and also a CD8 immunophenotype that was predefined by prior studies. Looking at TGE8 first, you can see in the box chart here, 
uh, that responders uh, were more likely to have a, uh, an increased TGA signature compared to those with stable disease and relapse. For the patients with the immunophenotypes, uh, and these were phenotypes that were defined previously as inflamed versus excluded, excluded in desert, or, or I'm sorry, desert, uh, they were expecting to find that they were more likely to have inflamed phenotypes in the, um, in the uh, responders. But as you can see here in the red and the orange, the in, an inflamed pheno, uh, phenotype comprised most of the patient populations in each group. So they went on to look at uh, a, uh, uh, a marker called GZNB, which is a marker for um, activated CD8 positive T cells to str stratify the inflamed phenotype further. When they did that, uh, they did find a, a significant difference here. For those in the, in the responder group, 87% um, of these patients with, um, in a, with inflamed phenotype also stayed positive for GZMB. Uh, when they looked at GZMB, uh, GZMB positivity in the, relapsed in the relapsed inflamed patients, uh, there was only about 30% positivity there. So, uh, But in short, CD8 T-cell associated gene signature and immunophenotype were associated with response. I'm not gonna deliberate this very long, but TMB and DDR and cell cycle genes were also explored as uh, predictive biomarkers. And as you can see here, uh, these did not correlate with outcomes. So in summary, significant activity with uh, neoadjuvant atezolizumab and uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer was seen in this study. We definitely need to still validate PCR as a surrogate marker for long-term outcomes in patients treated with new agent uh, immunotherapy agents. CD8 T-cell immunity phenotype and also gene signature may be useful biomarkers in this setting for response. And um, TMB and DDR signatures did not correlate with outcome. Based off of what they saw in terms of uh, the, the CD8 uh, associated factors, uh, uh, it does seem that uh, there's a chance that the, these factors may be different in patients with non-metastatic versus metastatic uh, cancer. So it may be uh, tr treatment for these patients uh, with immunotherapy may be, may be dependent on the, uh, the clinical setting. Uh, the last and third trial I want to talk about today is the Nabucco trial, which is a single arm phase 1b study of a new adjuvant uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab. And in this study, uh, patients were treated with uh, three cycles of uh, NEVO or IPI, and the primary endpoint here was feasibility, which was defined as resection within 12 weeks of, uh, of um, um, enrollment. And uh, patients who, uh, in terms of the eligibility criteria, some of the key ones here were that uh, upper tract primaries were allowed on the study. They only, for the node, positive, node negative patients, only allowed uh, T3 or T4A. Uh, and then for the node positive patients, T1 to T4A. Patients uh, were also uh, either cisplatin ineligible or a refused uh, cisplatin treatment. Uh, again, the primary endpoint was feasibility, as we discussed earlier, and secondary endpoints included PCR, but also safety and uh, translational research endpoints. So the preliminary endpoint uh, of, of feasibility and results were discussed at ESMO. Uh, 24 patients were recruited to this study. 96% of them did go on to have radical cystectomy. Eight, uh, 18 of 24, 75% of them did accomplish having three cycles of uh, nevo ipi And uh, uh, in regards to the PCR rate, uh, this was found to be 45% in uh, 20 out of uh, 10 out of 22 valuable patients. So the uh, downstaging rate was found to be 58%. Uh, and um, uh, notably, one patient did uh, recur really quickly uh, six weeks after surgery and died of metastasis. Further preliminary results were discussed at ASCO this year presented after a median follow-up of about 15 months. Uh, there were two relapses and one death. Uh, the relapse for survival at 15 months was 92%, which is very impressive. And uh, for survival, it was 96%. So very impressive uh, results being seen with this regimen, combination regimen uh, in a high-risk population. Looking at the, uh, some of the biomarkers, you can see here, TMB status was looked at in complete responders versus not, and there was a higher um, uh, uh, TMB, uh, higher, t higher TMB level in complete responders, although the, the p-value there was 0.056. TGF beta uh, expression was also looked at in complete responders versus not, and um, overall, non-CR uh, patients 
uh, had a higher TGF beta expression, uh, which suggests that this might be a, a, a biomarker for resistance. Uh, CD8, uh, intratumoral CD8 was also looked at, and there was no difference here. P value is 0.65. One interesting thing that they uh, presented was that uh, there were a few patients who had uh, discrepant res uh, results um, uh, from treatment. What this was defined as was that uh, patients who uh, attained a pathologic CR in the primary in the bladder, uh, but then uh, did have progression in disease found in the lymph nodes at time of, uh, of uh, surgery. And so they, uh, they did a whole genome sequencing and uh, two of these patients are listed here. Uh, as you can see here that the, uh, the um, the uh, genomic makeup of these patients and the uh, the progressing nodal tissue was different than that was uh, different than that what was found in the uh, the primary in the bladder, uh, which does kind of suggest that uh, in the future, um, if we were looking at uh, any any uh, biomarkers in in uh, uh, progressing patients, we uh, it might be important to look at uh, fresh tissue samples. In, in patients who are progressing uh, from uh, progressing metastatic sites. All right, so in summary, uh, neoadjuvant nevo-ipi was feasible with a robust uh, uh, PCR rate uh, and also impressive early survival um, uh, data at 15 months. Uh, the biomarker analysis from the study showed that TMB might be useful uh, uh, TGF beta also might be associated with uh, resistance. Looking across uh, at some of the currently reported uh, new adjuvant immunotherapy trials, I can see here uh, across the first couple of rows, target population varies quite widely in terms of cis vitamin eligibility and also T staging and N staging as well. But regardless of these differences, uh, you can see that the PCR rate here across the board is about 31 to 50 percent. Uh, the downstaging rate is about 51 to 66 percent. Most patients are also uh, found on these trials to be able to continue on with surgery uh, without any delays or uh, issues. And um, uh, in terms of the uh, adverse events, um, basically they vary widely, but in short, uh, patients with single agent therapy had less uh, adverse events. Some of these, uh, uh, these are some of the uh, ongoing future trials. And I'm going to skip ahead to uh, issues that we still uh, wait the resolution for. Uh, we are waiting uh, better data, longer term outcomes uh, from these neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy treatments uh, to confirm what we're seeing. Also, I think there needs to be a lot more research in terms of uh, predictive biomarkers. There's a lot of uh, 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 controversial data and discrepant data as well. Uh, some of these include uh, gene expressions and, and uh, DDR profiles. And I think that kind of begs the question of whether or not we should be looking at precision medicine earlier uh, in the, uh, in the uh, um, uh, muscle invasive setting um, that yet is yet to be determined. Um, also, um, uh, what's come to the surface is also that uh, these biomarkers may be different in the metastatic setting versus the uh, non-metastatic setting. So we might need to be repeating these um, over time. Um, of course, the last thing is I, I think uh, we should be focusing uh, more neoadjuvant treatment uh, for, for patients who are at higher risk, uh, and that includes uh, T3 or beyond or node positive patients. So, um, but in the future, uh, for cis and ineligible patients, neoadjuvant immunotherapy uh, treatments will likely be standard of care. For those who are cis eligible, chemo immunotherapy will likely be a standard option. And uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, non chemotherapy combinations that are effective as a new adjuvant treatment uh, for locally advanced disease in the near future. So, for all, thank you very much.